Welcome to what I call the annex of my warehouse where I film all my videos about ways to make money. This video is about how to make money selling used books, not on Amazon, not using Amazon FBA. I think it's great to do that. I love doing that. But there's another way you can do it, a way that I find very fun and can earn you between like probably 500 bucks and a couple thousand bucks a month. There obviously are people who make more doing that. So this is the other way to sell used books books on eBay, not on Amazon. And so there are a lot of people out there saying, well, most books that you sell are only worth like a dollar profit. There's so many booksellers on eBay who sell books for $3.95 or $4.95. And it really isn't worth it to sell those books. And I agree, you are 100% right. For most people who don't want to do enormous volume or who have employees, that kind of book resell, uh, reselling, resale does not really make sense. But what I've been doing for the past, well, two years, but really putting a lot of effort into it over the past like six months is selling one of a kind or rare or one off books, books where there's not a lot of competition. There is a equally small demand, but because these books are so old in pretty much every case, they're old books. Sometimes they're autographed. Sometimes it's bundles of books, but for the most part, they're old books. And so the people who are going to thrift stores and scanning barcodes are going to pass on these. And that gives you a little bit of a niche, a little bit of wiggle room. So if you're like me uh, and you don't want to get up and wait in line to go to a thrift store or just get there when the doors open up to be the first person to scan all the books, to get your five or ten books that will make you two or three bucks profit on Amazon, you can do this and find yourself with a reliable side hustle income. I'll talk. I'll show you some clips from my warehouse as we're talking through this, but really we'll talk about how to get these books, uh, how to list them, how to source them, how to price them, how to ship them. And I guess listing and pricing is the same, but it's kind of a, I want you to understand what I'm talking about. So the first thing, how do you get these books? I buy these books from a few main sources. One, estate sales, two, large buyouts, three thrift stores and four garage sale or like clean out pickup things. Really all it is is finding books for as cheap as you can that don't have barcodes. Now if they do have barcodes and they're free, take them uh, because you can just recycle those books and you'll be you'll be fine and make a little bit of money. But if you want to really kind of nail down the parameters of your business and you want to go only old collectible books, then uh, these are more likely the ones you're going to find that are being given away or at garage sales because a lot of people, like I said, who are doing Amazon are just going to scan the barcodes and the ones they can't get or can't find value in, they'll just donate because when you do uh, Amazon FBA books, your profit is all about streamlining your process. I mean, I guess it is to an extent buying things for cheap, but you're doing such a large volume that you're not really concerned about making only a dollar per book because Amazon does all the fulfillment. I have other videos on that. They're a few years old. If you really want to hear about how FBA works in 2022, let me know in the comments below. So you can get these the same way you get pretty much everything else. And that's like I said, estate sales, thrift stores, garage sales, buyouts, cleanouts. If you know other ways, I'm sure you go to old bookstores too. I'm sure there's other ways, but that's what I do. Uh, and then when you get them, you got to take the pictures. The pictures, that's really not as crazy as you think it might be. And so I'll show you now how I do that. This is my book listing setup right now. Look how messy this is, but really it doesn't matter. Uh, if you have a book like this, this is a calfskin pocket Bible, the King James edition, if I recall correctly, I've already listed it. Got the ribbon there, got some gold. Uh, one of these have sold in the past 30 days for $75. There are two listed right now. A lot of books like this, but only one other with this button right here. And that's the kind of, you see, it says calf skin, calf skin, calf skin leather right there. That's the kind of unique detail that allows you to take what I would admit uh, are kind of subpar pictures. Uh, because first of all, it's a used book. They're going to expect, I mean, as long as you document, okay, look, there's some smudges right there. Who cares if my hand is in the picture? Who cares if it isn't perfectly lit? You know, who cares if I have other books in the background? And I would probably argue that that's even better because if I sell these weird one-off books, like The Strange World of the Moon, uh, very few people are looking for this book, in, you know, specifically this book. Uh, what they do like, though, is it's an old weird book about aliens and astronomy. So if I have a stack of similar books, they're going to say, okay, I don't want this one. 
but he does have a different one. I mean, right now it's not probably the closest I have to that right now is is Fantastic Voyage. This is actually a book that was an FBA return for me. Uh, and I only sold it because I think it's a cool book. I think that Ray Kurzweil is cool. But this kind of having a messy background, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are going to say, you can never do that. It's so unprofessional. Uh, but all I, all I care about is selling books and making a little bit of money. And so if I can do it faster, just like this, like, ooh, picture. Oh, a picture here. A picture here. You know, a picture here. Let's show them the date that it was made. 1959. Printed in Great Britain. Yeah, as long as I show them all these details, not many people are going to be that particular about a, a book that's got a tear on the back cover, you know, or a Bible that's not new. If these were new, yeah, I'd take a bit more effort into showing how pristine they are, but they're not new. Same with these video games. I mean, it's a different topic, but just like it, there are so many people who are paralyzed by not having everything perfect. And you don't have to be like that. You can just do it and get better as you go on. I mean, I'm sure a year from now, I'll have a better... I'll even show you. I have this nice little little light kit now. Literally, two years ago, I was putting books on my lap, showing my dirty green sweatpants that I was wearing, and those books still sold. Like, it's not about being perfect, it's about showing up. And I think a lot of people know what I'm talking about, where they feel like because they don't have everything taken into account or everything isn't perfect, they can't start. Just start. It's okay. The same goes for pricing. How do you price these books? How do you price a book where there's no sales history? How do you price a book that is a one-of-a-kind item? Personally, what I do, I have two main things that I do. So the first thing I'll do for any book that seems especially rare. So if you, there's an author that I don't know, and I look up the author's name, and there's nothing online about them, that's probably not a super rare book. I mean, most of these books that are worth thousands of dollars or, or hundreds of dollars, they're worth that because of reasons that you can research very easily. But by the same token, if that author is writing a book about seahorses or something else that caught my eye on a thrift store shelf, I'm still going to buy that book, even though the, the author and the exact title are not popular, uh, the topic is. So for books like that, where there's no sales history or limited sales history, but it has the right look or it has the right theme or topic, I'm going to minimum price those books at 50 bucks, and then I make the buyer pay shipping. I do this because, again, if they want it, they're going to pay for it. And having that additional shipping charge in there, it just encourages me to do a good job and lets the buyer know that, yeah, I'm not just trying to cut corners wherever I can. The book is going to be shipped correctly, and I'll go into that later in the video. It's really simple, nothing too crazy. But what if the book is a bit more valuable? So there are two main ways I go about this, and there are more ways. You can, you can have a subscription to WorthPoint. You can do stuff like that. But mainly what I'm doing is doing a Google search and then checking completed sales on eBay. You can do that pretty simply over the past 90 days using just the eBay search function. But if you want to go beyond that, you have to go into your eBay seller dashboard, go to the research tab, go to Terapeak, and that's going to give you a 12-month sales history. Uh, and that's how I price more accurately uh, what a book is going for. If there are existing titles of that book, I'm going to price right around the same uh, number. So that book that I showed you, The Moon Book, uh, over the past 90 days, one copy sold for 50 bucks on auction. There's one copy listed right now for 75 bucks with the dust jacket and one without the dust jacket, which is the second printing, for $19. So what I'll do in this case is I'm going to go at about 65 bucks. It's $10 below the highest price book and considerably above the lowest price book because I know in this case, the person who buys this book is not going to be buying the second edition. They're not buying this because it has any special content inside of it. They're buying it because of what it represents, how it looks, stuff like that. And so as long as I'm cheaper than the person asking 75 bucks, when someone looks this up, if they do a little bit of price research, I should still get that sale, even though the last sale is about 15 bucks less than that. I mean, it was an auction, but still, when you're comparing the two, uh, someone who is not as experienced might try and go below that $50 sale price and uh, lose themselves some money. 
This is how I have all of my old books listed. It's just stacked up with the spine facing me so I can read it. I've got a little bit of organization in terms of like, you know, back here are all the books on religion and I should probably put more of the Bibles back there. But for the most part, they're just kind of all thrown together and I just have to remember where they are. Is that the best system? No, it's not a good system, but it's better than not having books listed. These are all my DVDs and there's some more DVDs back there. And like, okay, maybe this is overwhelming for you. Organize it better, you know, do it better. As I move these books into my garage and hopefully can utilize this space for other things, uh, I will definitely alphabetize them. But what I would do if I were to alphabetize these books is I would go by title. And I know that's kind of, usually you see it by author. I would go by title just because that's easier. And if there is, for me, it's easier. And if it's The Enigma War, I would just remove that and this would go in the E section. That's how I do it. I, I've sold DVDs and CDs before. That's how I did that. Um, generally like batch shipping or batch uh, inventory by the first letter that's not like an article. Um, so like uh or the, I think uh is an article. So the, this would just be W or V I mean. This would be Inferno, uh, I. And I would put them like that. Now I kind of try and have my paperbacks together. I try and kind of have, whoops, kicked a chair almost. I try and kind of have like all my old, old books together because these are the hardest ones to really pick out of the crowd. Uh, there's some very, very thin books uh, right here. I mean, look how messy this is, but does it really matter? No, it doesn't really matter as long as I can find it. And I haven't had to cancel a sale on a book in the, in the two years I've been doing this, trying to sell these one-offs on eBay. Uh, all these like type of pamphlets um, are gonna go right here. Very small ones, these would not fit on the, uh, obviously if that was lined up on its side, I would lose that. And then these are just like overflow. What I have to do is go through all of those uh, boxes of books down there, list those, and then put those on the shelf or, or throw them away if they're not going to be um, in the correct condition and put these there. But, you know, in my mind, it makes more sense to list them and have them be unorganized and messy and still bring in 50 to 100 to 150 a day in old, you know, I'm not going to call them garbage books, but just like books that are being passed up by most booksellers. If I can make an extra two or three grand a month doing that and it has to look like this until I can get a better setup, I'm going to do that. So we've talked about where to find the books, how to take pictures and list them, where, how to store them how to price them. When the book sells, and when you sell books like this, if you have a couple hundred or a couple thousand for sale, you're gonna sell a few every single day. That's the beauty of this long tail traffic where people want you know weird esoteric stuff is it's always occurring. And as long as you're listing a few times a week, you're gonna be seeing traffic to your store and you're gonna be making sales. I have two main ways that I ship these books out. So some of those books you saw are Amazon returns, or their bad buys or their books that I've had for a long time. So those books might be worth like 10 bucks or five bucks or 15 bucks. For those cheap books, they just go into a poly mailer because most of the time, the condition does not really matter. They're pre-owned books and they weigh under you know, a pound or two. And so they're not gonna get more banged up than they appear in the picture when they get to the buyer. I've had no complaints. Now the second way and the more important way and how I ship every single book that goes for more than probably 40 or 50 bucks is I'm shipping in a box. And the beauty of all this is there's not really a big price difference. With other things you sell, how large the box is, how much it weighs, that's gonna have a significant effect on the price of shipping depending on where it goes in the country. For media mail, this is all media mail, you're not gonna pay a lot. Now, if you're selling like a bundle of 50 books and it weighs 50 pounds, yeah, it's gonna be like 25 bucks, but that's still so much cheaper than if it was going priority or UPS ground or FedEx home, whoever you use. A lot of these small books under a pound, currently it's 319 to ship a book under a pound. I think two pounds, under two pounds is like 345. Um, I'm never paying more than like eight bucks to ship a book out occasionally I'll get like some huge encyclopedia that's around eight or 10 bucks, but all the books that you saw for, I, I can't think of one now that I'm thinking about it, that goes for more than like eight or 10 bucks. And so that is very simple. And it shows you like, why would you try and cut corners? If there's a night like that leather bound calf skin book, very small under a pound, that's still going to go in a box because if someone buys a $80 Bible from me, 
it's gonna be have, it's gonna have a good presentation when it gets there. I'm gonna wrap it in craft paper. That's like brown paper you can buy at Walmart or roll for five bucks or larger. You know, a larger roll on Amazon for cheaper than that. And then I'm gonna bubble wrap that. I'm gonna put that in a box. And so even though you and I both know that those extra steps don't really do anything, I mean it's a 18 ounce Bible or less than that. Uh, the presentation and the experience they get is really gonna matter. The last thing I want is an angry buyer who bought a $75 book that I paid 50 cents for. That's just not good. If you're selling books that are really popular, uh, like the kind of books that sell 10 or 50 copies a day, like number one bestsellers, then yeah, I understand trying to cut corners to lower costs because if you can save a dollar per book and you're selling 50 a day, that adds up pretty fast. But for these books where it's, okay, I have something someone wants and really I'm more providing a service and that service is showing them, hey, if you like old Christian stuff, you're gonna like this. If you like old alien stuff, you're gonna like this. They want a, a better experience. Uh, and cutting corners and putting your $80 Bible in a poly mailer and just shipping it out because it saves you 40 cents is a, a very bad strategy and not gonna get you long-term buyers. Because you know what? About one in 25 of my buyers are repeat customers. And that might seem pretty low, but it definitely adds up fast. Same for my sports cards business. I'll talk about that in a different video as well. When you can get repeat buyers who are willing to pay a little bit more because they know you're gonna provide a good service, that's when you can start really having a lot more reliable income. And you can change your sporadic you know, 200 bucks a month in eBay sales to like thousands of dollars and it's a lot more sustainable and reliable. My name is Blake. I don't think I ever mentioned that. I think a lot of you know me, but if you don't know me and you're new here, please, I encourage you subscribe. And if you do know me, pop a comment below with what you thought of this video. If you've sold books, some pieces you like and any other videos you'd love to hear me talk about. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate you guys doing that and I'll see you later.